Welcome to today's presentation, Suicide Prevention Ac Across the Educational Continuum. If we could go to the next slide, please. Thank you. So this disclaimer notes that the work of the Mountain Plains Mental Health Technology Transfer Center and Mountain Plains Prevention Technology Transfer Center is supported by SAMHSA as well as DHHS. We would like to note that today's presentation is provided free of charge and all of this information is available in the public domain. Also, the information presented today are the views and opinions of Aaron Briley and do not reflect the official position of DHHS or SAMHSA. If you have any questions about this information, please feel free to contact us. Let's go to the next slide, please. Thank you. So it's my pleasure to introduce our presenter today. Ms. Erin Briley is a nationally certified school psychologist. She recently began working for WICHE's Behavioral Health Program as a research and technical assistant associate. She earned her bachelor's degree in human development and family studies at Colorado State University, her master's degree in counseling and school psychology, as well as a certificate in applied behavioral analysis at California State University, Los Angeles. She is also working on her PhD in clinical psychology. Ms. Briley's work with the WICHE Behavioral Health Program includes a variety of behavioral health projects, but her primary role is currently assisting in the creation and implementation of psychology internships, internship consortiums in rural Western states, as well as involvement with school behavioral health projects. Prior to coming to WICHE, Ms. Briley worked for about 20 years in schools, serving primarily as a school psychologist for school districts in California, Hawaii, and Colorado where she provided direct care and indirect supports for children ages two through 22 of all developmental levels. While in Hawaii, Ms. Briley also served temporarily as a special education administrator and, a, and as a program manager for the school-based behavioral health program for Hawaii's Department of Education. She also trained and supervised paraprofessionals providing individualized supports to children with special needs. I'll now turn things over to Aaron Briley for our presentation today, and thank you so much for joining us. Hi, good morning. Um, thank you for joining us today. Um, before we get started, I just want to let you know that in no way does this replace advanced training in suicide response and risk assessment. If anything, if you are one of the lucky few that um, that does have to uh, respond to um, potentially suicidal youth, I do highly recommend advanced training. I've done it myself and it resulted in a lot more confidence and skill sets to uh, approaching um, youth with this sort of difficulty. I did provide some resources at the end of the training for that sort of thing. Um, at, in order to get started, I think it's really important to clarify the differences and I'm sure many of you already know this, so I apologize if I'm sort of um, going back to the basics. The difference between suicide, suicide attempt, and suicide ideation. Uh, now, suicide uh, results in actual death um, via self-directed injurious behavior. So there is an intent to die. It is not, um, it is not a unintentional death. Okay, so it is. There is definitely an intent there. A suicide attempt is a non-fatal self-directed injurious behavior. There's an intent to die. Um, but it was a non-fatal attempt. Suicidal ideation is when people have thoughts of suicide. They might think that, you know, I wish I were dead. Um, I wish I weren't alive anymore, but it may or may not include a plan of action. Okay. Um, looking at some statistics, um, it is really important to understand how serious this problem is with the youth of our nation. So 17% high schoolers have reported seriously considering suicide in 2017, and those rates increase significantly for other populations, such as those that are LGBTQ and other ethnic groups. So you can see those with LGBTQ, the rates actually jump to 47.7%. That is huge. Suicide is ranked as the 10th leading cause of death in 2017 for all age ranges, but for youths aged 10 to 24, it is the second uh, leading cause of death, okay? So that's pretty extreme. 
Um, in 2017, suicide nearly tripled for youth aged 10 to 14, increased 76% for ages 15 through 19, and increased 36% for ages 20 to 24 as compared to 2007. So the rates are increasing for suicide. Um, for those that are American Indian or Alaska Native youth, um, ages 15 through 34, suicides rates are 1.5 times that of the national average, and rates for males is nearly three times as high as compared to females for ages 15 to 19. Okay, I just wanted to give you a little bit of a visual so you can understand um, the severity or the frequency rate of those that have committed suicide uh, for our youth ages 5 through 21. And you can see that it is um, really uh, elevated for our centralized states here. Okay, so let's just move on to risk factors. What are risk factors? Risk factors are characteristics associated with increased risk, and risk does increase with multiple factors. Um, just because you have a risk factor does not mean that you are suicidal, but the more risk factors you have, the more we want to kind of keep an eye on things, okay? So some of the things we want to look at are, have there been previous attempts? Does the child engage in non-suicidal self-injury, such as cutting? And I want to make a little note that just because you cut does not make you suicidal, but if you have suicidal ideation and you cut at the same time, it's going to elevate our concerns. Um, is there a history of mental illness, hopelessness, or low self-esteem? Is a child impulsive or have risk-taking tendencies? That's a huge concern right there. We'll get into that in a little bit. Is there a poor problem-solving or coping skills? Does a child have low stress and frustration tolerance? Uh, is there social alienation or isolation or, or, or non-conforming? Essentially, uh, if a child feels a sense of connectedness, it, it's a really, it's a great protective factor, but if they feel they don't fit in, it can be a big concern, okay? Other risky behaviors include uh, alcohol or drug use, delinquency, aggressive or violent behavior, risky sexual behavior, Exposure to suicidal behavior of others via media or other. And you know, with our, our media, it's really out there. And there are some communities where um, there is a higher suicidal rate than other communities. So that's always a concern if you have a high suicide rate in your community. Family characteristics we want to consider include a family history of suicide, uh, parental mental health problems, family stress and dysfunction, uh, experiencing a stressful life event or a loss or a situational crisis. Um, one thing in there that adults sometimes don't tend to take seriously are breakups. Breakups are catastrophic for our, for our adolescents. It's a big deal. Um, so you never want to brush off a, a breakup, tell them there's other fish in the sea. Uh, you really want to be compassionate to to their experience that they're having. And of course, other types of stressors include uh, abuse, divorce, deaths of loved ones, and the list can go on and on. Environmental factors that we wanna consider include once again, exposure to suicidal behaviors of others, a negative social and emotional environment at school. And that goes back to really wanting to promote school connectedness is always a, a, a good thing to have. Um, Expression and acts of hostility, lack of respect and fair treatment, limitations in school and physical environments, including lack of safety and security, access to lethal means, and exposure to stigma and discrimination. And once again, that goes back to feeling as if one doesn't conform to their, you know, to their immediate surroundings. Okay. I wanted to also talk about signs of depression in young children as well as, as youth um, because sometimes they're manifested differently than adults and it's important for us to be attentive to signs of depression in our youth. Some of the things that we're looking for in young children include uh, intense irritability and frequent tantruming, uh, often talking about fears or worries, somatic complaints, somatic complaints meaning uh, complaining about stomach aches or headaches or, or things of that nature that have no medical cause. 
um, being very active except when um, watching TV or playing video games, sleeping too much or too little, having frequent nightmares or seem sleepy during the day, no interest in playing with others or they have difficulty making friends, struggling academically or having a recent decline in their grades, repeating actions or checking things many times out of fear that something bad might happen. Okay. Now, when we're looking at our older children and teenagers, some of the things we want to look at when we're, we're considering signs of depression include loss of interest in things they used to enjoy. That's a big one. Sleeping too much or too little or sleeping, seeming sleepy throughout the day, having low energy, increased isolation, avoiding social activities, a fear of gaining weight or dieting or exercising excessively. Self-harm behaviors such as cutting or burning their skin, things of that nature. Risky or destructive behaviors including substance use. Periods of highly elevated energy or activity or requiring much less sleep than previously. Or sometimes we have youth that think that someone is trying to control their minds or they hear things that, they, that others cannot hear. So those, are all, those can all um, be signs of depression in our older, older youth, okay? Um, besides looking at risk factors, the other thing we wanna consider are warning signs. Now, warning signs are observable favor, behaviors that signal uh, suicidal thinking. So when we see warning signs, it's, we're gonna, our concern is gonna elevate, okay? Um, when we're looking at warning signs, these are going to be changes in behaviors, feelings, and beliefs about oneself. Uh, we, they generally last about two or more weeks, but they can occur impulsively. So there is no hard and set rule, which is what makes this difficult, right? Because sometimes we have to fly off the seat of our pants when making decisions. Some of the warning signs include anxiety, agitation, and dramatic mood changes reckless or engaging in risky activities, unable to sleep or sleeping all the time, increased alcohol or drug use, withdrawal from friends, family, and society, feeling trapped like there's no way out, rage, uncontrollable anger, and seeking revenge. Um, now, warnings become acute, meaning we wanna act immediately when these three things are present, okay? Threatening to hurt or kill themselves or talking about wanting to die, okay? Looking for ways to kill themselves by seeking access to lethal means, talking or writing about death, dying, or suicide. Um, so at that point, we wanna find out if there's a detailed plan for the, for the potential attempt. How are they planning to do it? Where are they planning to do it? When are they planning to do it? The other thing I wanna add in here, sometimes with the younger kids that I've worked with or um, children who are uh, developmentally disabled, I see oh, a lot of artwork related to this. Um, one thing that I found, however, is that children who play a lot of violent video games or watch a lot of violent media um, tend to um, produce a lot of violent themed artwork as well. So sometimes you need to kind of discriminate between the two, but I have seen artwork as a potential warning sign for suicide as well. Um, one note, if you see a kid or, or actually anybody um, and they've suddenly, they have a sudden uh, improvement after a period of being very sad and withdrawn, um, that could be a warning sign as well because there could have been a decision been made, been made to escape their problems by ending their life, okay? The thought of that alone releases a lot of that anxiety, causing them to have a sudden improvement in behavior. So that is one thing um, we don't want to discount, okay? Um, other warning signs for youth specifically. So the, the warning signs we talked about before are warning signs in general for everybody. This is for youth. Um, talking about or making plans for suicide, uh, being hopeless about the future. Hopelessness is a huge sign, a, a very big predictor of suicide. Um, having severe or overwhelming emotional pain or distress or exhibiting, exhibiting worrisome behavioral cues or marked behavioral change. For example, 
There has been withdrawal or changes in social connections. There's changes in sleep. They're either sleeping too much or they're, 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 they have insomnia or they're not sleeping enough. They have anger that seems out of character or out of context. Um, levels of agitation and irritability have increased recently. Okay, those are all things that are going to spark a concern for youth. Okay, the other thing that increases the risk for suicide is when warning signs are new and or increased and possibly related to an anticipated or actual painful event, loss, or change. Now, protective factors are great, okay? Protective factors don't necessarily shield a, a child from risk if they're already actively suicidal, but they can help us with safety planning, okay? Um, some of the individual characteristics we wanna consider are the child's emotional well-being and emotional intelligence. Are they adaptable and flexible to changes? Are they resilient? Do they have internal control over their environment? Okay, or do they point the finger at, at external controls? Do they have strong problem solving, coping and conflict resolution skills? Do they engage in frequent and vigorous exercise or do they participate in sports? Do they have a connection to spiritual faith, uh, cultural beliefs that affirm life? Uh, do they have a healthy frustration tolerance and emotional regulation? Uh, we want to consider, do they have a positive body image, uh, care of their body, protecting themselves? Some of the uh, social supports that are considered to be protective factors would be Connections, we talked about connections a little bit. Connectedness is absolutely huge. We want children to feel they have supportive bonds, not only with their family and caring adults and their peers, but also with their school environment as well. Um, is there parental involvement? Is there peer involvement? Uh, do parent parents have pro-social norms? Is there family support to the school? In terms of school supports, we want to make sure that there are positive school environments. Is the climate safe and respectful? Okay, so that's one of the first things we want to do with our schools is making sure that the overall climate is safe. We want our children to feel that they're safe in their schools and that it's a respectful place to be, despite maybe not being non-conforming with the typical climate or the typical community. Um, the other thing is we want to make sure that the children have adequate or, or, or better improved academic achievements. And once again, connectedness. It's really all about relationships, it's about being connected. Okay, they want to be part of a school, school community. We do want to consider a child's um, internal resources. We want to look at their ability to cope with stress religious beliefs, and frustration tolerance. The other thing we wanna, wanna look at is their external factors. We wanna look at their responsibility to others, their positive therapeutic relationships, and their social supports. Okay, so you can see here that relationships and social supports and connectedness plays a very, very, very big role um, in attending to youth and supporting them. Okay. Now, research does show that a brief screening tool can ident identify individuals at risk for suicide more reliably than leaving the identification up to clinicians' personal judgment of right, asking about suicidal thoughts using vague or softened language. So we're gonna talk about um, being specific in a little bit. Um, I was very uncomfortable doing that at first too, but it's changed my life as a school psychologist and being able to identify kids a lot more readily once I started being very a lot more specific, okay? We'll talk about that more. Now, what's a screener and what's a suicide assessment? I worked in the schools, you know, um, my whole professional life until now, okay? A screener um, is, is a protocol, it can be a protocol, it doesn't always have to be standardized, but it could be a standardized instrument or a protocol to identify suicide risk. 
We can do it universally, meaning it can be done with all students in the school or selectively. So let's say a teacher comes up to you, hey, I have a concern about so-and-so, I'm their art teacher, there's a lot of dark themes, they're moody, they're not you know, um, socializing with your other peers. And at that point, I'm gonna pull the child out and do a screening, right? So we're gonna do a screening when a child either informs us of an attempt thought or plan, or if we learn of an attempt through a peer or staff member, or simply because we believe the student to be at risk ourselves, okay? Now, a suicidal assessment is a comprehensive eval done by a clinician to confirm the risk. And at that point, not only are they confirming risk, they're estimating immediate danger and they're determining the course of treatment, okay? So in the schools, my job was primarily doing the suicidal screening. I may have gone a little bit into estimating immediate danger, but I was lucky enough to have some mobile crisis units that would come in to, to um, do an additional assessment on, on top of the screener that I just performed. In terms of basic guidelines, always, always, always refer to your school's crisis protocol. If you don't know your crisis protocol, find out what it is, okay? Um, so if you are, I'm not sure the um, who exactly is attending. I'm sure we have people who, um, are responders and have been trained to be responders. I'm sure we have people here who are simply trying to acquire more skills to figure out when to defer out. You always want to refer, if you have a child with a concern, refer them out to somebody who's been trained to recognize and respond to this. People in your school um, that might fall into this role could include school counselors, behavioral health specialists, school psychologists, school-based clinical psychologist, and school social workers, okay? If you are unable to locate that person, so if you're not this person, you're unable to locate this person, we do want to alert administration and determine if the crisis team needs to be called to assess for imminence. And if that is true, we want to alert the parents. In emergencies, we want to alert administration, call 911 um, and the parents. I've only, by the way, I've only had to call 911 maybe two times. We do wanna ensure that school staff are aware of the referral response protocol and basic guidelines. Now, my recommendation would be that your office staff is aware of response protocol. Um, sometimes there's situations when all behavioral health staff at the school are away at training, for example, this has happened before, um, and a student is presenting with suicidal ideation and they require a screening. Um, and people need to know who to go to, what to do. So your administrators need to know what the protocol is and your office staff need, definitely need to know what the protocol is. And I would recommend that your teachers know what the protocol is, at least know who to refer to, at least knowing what that first step is. When we are doing a risk assessment, the things that we wanna do is, first of all, we wanna identify the risk factors and we wanna pay attention to the things that can be reduced and definitely explore if there's been past attempts at suicide or if there's a family history. Um, next, what we wanna do is we kind of wanna identify and mobilize protective factors. Is there anything that could stop them? Consider pets too. Pets is one thing that we don't often concern. Do you have a dog in your life that you're crazy about? Let's talk more about that dog. Oh, you have a baby brother that you take care of a lot and you think is really adorable and you spend a lot of time about. Let's talk about your baby brother. We want to kind of bring them back to things that, that bring them some joy, okay? In terms of the suicidal in inquiry, the things that we wanna look at, number one, is ideation. Okay, so if you guys remember, ideation are thoughts of suicide. It may or may not mean that the student has a plan. We don't know. So we wanna find out how long uh, they've been thinking about suicide, how frequently, how intense. Um, and of course, we want to make sure we are developmentally appropriate when we're asking these questions. Um, some of the prompt questions we can, we can say is, are you thinking of suicide? Have you thought about suicide in the last two months? Have you ever attempted to kill yourself? 
Notice I'm being very specific about my language. I am not using a vague terminology like, are you thinking of hurting yourself? Okay, because some youth or some people um, either are about, they didn't technically ask me if I'm gonna, you know, I'm thinking about killing myself. So I'm gonna say no, because technically speaking, that's not true. The moment I became very specific in my questioning, the moment that I, I started asking students when I started noticing incongruencies, right, between what they're telling me and their facial affect, hey, you know, I'm really concerned here, you're mentioning this and that, it sounds like it's a lot to be dealing with, with this right now, I have to ask, have you ever thought about killing yourself? Yes, yes, I have. Wow, that's really tough. When was the last time you thought that? This morning, last week, three days ago. These are questions that I never would have asked early in my career because I was trained that we don't ask unless, unless we have specifics. Now I know it's very important to be specific about your, your terminology, okay? So it is okay to say, suicide. It is okay to ask if they're planning to kill themselves. It's uncomfortable, but it's necessary to be specific. The other thing we want to talk about, so we've already talked about ideation. So if we find out about ideation, okay, so they've had thoughts of killing themselves. Is there a plan? Have they talked about or have they considered how they intend to do it if they could? Okay, so you want to get specifics. Okay, Oh, wow. So you, you thought about killing yourself last week. That's rough. Did you think about how you would do it if you could? Okay. The next thing we want to ask about is access. Do they have the means to carry out with the plan? Oh, so you thought about uh, you would take, you would overdose. Okay. Um, you know, is there, there, is there any sort of medication that you thought that you would use? Well, is there any of that in the home? that sort of thing, okay? I had a student, for example, tell me, yeah, I thought about killing myself. I thought about it this morning. Wow, so have you thought about how you would do it? Well, yeah, I actually walked in front of a car and they, they swerved around me, okay? There you, I've, I've hit the plan, I've hit the access, and they actually told me about their intent, which is pretty eminent. The next thing after the access is, we're gonna talk about have they made plans to follow through with their plan? Okay, yes, I thought about ODing. Yes, I have access to that medication. Um, and yes, I, I, plan, I plan to make it happen. Okay, I plan to make it happen. Um, if it is imminent, meaning forthcoming, is happening very soon, usually within the next 24, 48 hours, you want to obtain immediate assistance or emergency response. Emergency response. And typically we, re we send those students to uh, the ER. Okay, they, we can't let them, um, those are the students that we can't leave alone, okay? Um, and the one thing I want to comfort people with is asking about intent to kill oneself is not correlated with suicidality. They've actually done some research related to that and there is no correlation, okay? So I don't want you to think, well, I'm uncomfortable asking that because if I ask that, I'm gonna plant the thought in your head you don't have to worry about that, okay? It is more important for you to be direct, okay? Um, after we determine imminency, we want to determine the risk level and if the crisis team should be contacted. And of course, we wanna document all our steps. And yes, this is for legality, definitely for legality, but also to make sure that we followed our, our protocol, okay? So let's talk about um, levels of risk, okay? Um, in order to be, I, we're, look, we're gonna be, first of all, talking about high levels of risk, moderate levels of risk, and low levels of risk. So when we're looking at high levels of risk, some of the um, risk and protective factors we're looking at are, um, does a youth have psychiatric disorder with severe symptoms or acute precipitating events? Um, protective factors really aren't relevant at this state. You know, they could have all the protective factors in the world, but if they're at high level of risk, we're gonna go ahead and act immediately. Um, in terms of suicidality, there really is potential for a lethal suicide attempt or persistent ideation with strong attempt or suicide rehearsal, 
Okay, at this point, we really do want to contact the crisis team. So you do, it is helpful for you guys to know who is on your crisis team. Okay, uh, the, all the districts that I worked in, in California, Hawaii, and Colorado, uh, we did have mobile crisis teams that were, I believe, employed by Department of Health. We'd contact them, they'd come right in, they'd do the assessment, um, so our protocol was nice and clean. We knew exactly what we had to do. Um, I understand that some districts don't have um, an outside crisis team, but sometimes they have established a district level crisis team. If you do not have a crisis team, I would talk to your department head and, and admin about potentially establishing one, okay? When we're looking at moderate levels of risk, um, we're, these type of kids usually have multiple risk factors and very few protective factors, okay? Um, and usually there is suicide, su su suicidal ideation with a plan, but there's no intent, meaning, yeah, you know, life sucks. I wish I was dead. I thought about that if I were to commit suicide, this is how I would do it. But no, no, no ways. I wouldn't, I wouldn't go through with it. Uh, there's no way I could leave my little brother or I just couldn't do that to anybody, okay? That doesn't mean that we're not gonna be concerned about this student. We're still gonna develop a safety plan for them, but we know that their suicidality is not imminent, okay? They are at moderate list, uh, level of risk, okay? Some of the interventions that we might wanna do is we may have to contact the crisis team. It, that really kind of depends on the situation, okay? There's no easy answer for that. We definitely do want to contact a crisis or develop a crisis plan and we want to provide resources. Now for our low levels of risk, um, at this point, these kids usually have modifiable risk factors and some strong protective factors. Great. Um, but there is ideation, okay? These kids usually have thoughts of suicide, but there is no plan. Yeah, life sucks and sometimes I wish I was dead. Um, no, I haven't thought about how I would go forth with doing that. I, I, I have, no, I, I just, life just really sucks sometimes. So there's no, there's no intent to follow through and there's no plan, okay? Some of the interventions we're gonna do is uh, provide some outpatient referrals. We want them to learn alternative positive coping skills, right? We want to reduce their, their symptoms of depression or anxiety or whatever they're going, they're, they're experiencing, as well as provide resources, okay? So no matter the level of risk, we're always providing resources. We're always always developing a plan of action to help um, either provide coping resources or more immediate forms of um, intervention. Okay. Now this is everything that I, I talked about is just in a, um, a a little table to make it easier to access for you. So if you choose to download the presentation, um, you can go ahead and use this. And when I was in the schools. Um, this is what I would, I would use um, to help me figure out when to contact who and what steps to take next. Okay, so this I found very helpful to kind of have it in a little table. Okay, now there is a problem with, with these levels of risk, okay? One of the, the problems that, that um, some research talk about is, hey, suicide, suicidality is dynamic. There's a lot of things in a child's life that can influence the, the level of severity at any point in time. Um, so you could have a child who, or I shouldn't just say child, you could have anyone who's perfectly fine at one moment and then experience something that they perceive as catastrophic or stressful and it, and it pushes them up to the next level. You just never know. Um, the other thing that we want to take into consideration too is, is children who are impulsive right? We want to be cons very concerned with children who are impulsive because let's say, for example, they um, just have ideation, okay? But if they're impulsive and they're experiencing some intense feelings of ideation and they're near a potential means, they could make a decision right then and there, okay? So we always want to make sure that we are, we are very cautious when it comes to children who are impulsive. Um, other factors that should be included when we're determining severity of risk includes the patient's current available and accessible resources, foreseeable changes in their future, are there any events or stressors that might be coming up that we need to take into account that could influence their risk, and comparing their current risk state to their baseline or their, or their worst point of, of state. 
Okay, so basically, um, you know, these levels of risk are extremely helpful, but it's saying you have to be flexible when working with our kid, kids and identifying where we think they are because it, it really could be fluid. Okay, when we are working with our kiddos, we do want to be compassionate. Show them that you care. Listen to them. Be genuine. Okay. For, for those of you, the majority of you that work with youth, you already know if you are not genuine, you've, you've lost the battle, right? You're not going to be able to connect with them. You want to connect with them. And the only way we connect with them is trying to build that relationship um, as soon as we can, as fast as we can. And, and sometimes it's difficult. For example, as a school psychologist, I didn't always know these, these students. Sometimes my, my VP was walking into my room. Hey, Aaron, this is um, so-and-so. Could you talk to them? Um, they've been having these thoughts. And I have to try and build a, a, a trust factor right then and there. Okay, and that's the first step I'm going to do is, is be as genuine as possible and show them that I care. Ask the question. Be direct. We've talked about this already. Do not use vague terminology. I know it's uncomfortable being direct, but really you have to become comfortable doing that. So be direct, carrying it non-confrontational. Hey, I'm really concerned. You know, you look like you're really down. I noticed these things. You know, I had to ask, are you thinking about suicide? Are you thinking about killing yourself? And even if they say no, you might, have you ever thought about that in the past? Okay, you want to follow up with, have they ever thought about it in the past? The next thing is you don't want to leave them alone, especially for higher levels of imminence. Um, you don't want to leave them alone. You don't want to leave them in your office as you run out to go get help from somebody else, to go consult with somebody else. Um, if, if you need to consult with somebody, um, hopefully there's somebody that they can trust that you can have in the room with them while you go and consult with somebody else. I've actually had professionals just walk outside of the door to talk somebody to somebody and they walked in and the child is carving their arm out with a uh, push pins that they found in the bulletin board. Um, scissors that um, had to get some scissors away from students that they found in desks. So, you know, kids, people, people can get very resourceful when they um, are, are, have made up their mind in terms of what they wanted to do. Do They're very distraught. Do not leave them alone. Okay. Some of the things that are not helpful um, when working with these kids are um, we don't want to ignore them and we, we don't want to dismiss them. We don't want to make their feelings feel less than. Remember how I talked about um, the child who had a very painful breakup. They're with their first girlfriend for a week, for two weeks, and they're devastated. They, they got dumped. Okay. We don't want to laugh that off. We know that two weeks in the life of an adult can be a disappointment, but we're going to move on. For, for kids like this, we want to hear their pain. We want to care about their pain. We want to believe them. This is very real for them. This is their perception, not ours. Okay, so we, so we want to, um, we really want to acknowledge, acknowledge them, okay? Um, second, we don't want to act shocked or embarrassed. And that is, that's hard to do sometimes. You can act caring and compassionate, but you don't want to act shocked. Sometimes when you get that shocked um, uh, reaction, they'll shut down, okay? So you want them to feel comfortable engaging with you and sharing with you. The other thing is you don't want to panic. You don't want to preach. You don't want to patronize. I know a lot of these things that I'm talking about, I'm preaching to the choir. You all know about this, but clearly this is in the research because people are out there doing that. Um, most people that I've seen are very appropriate with our kids, but I've seen some trained people um, who aren't, you know, and so let's build our skill sets and, and be better than before because we all have things that we can learn, right? Um, we don't want to challenge or debate or bargain, okay, because you, they're thinking irrationally. You can't bargain with somebody who's thinking irrationally, okay? You, uh, please be careful. Do not give harmful advice. Okay, um, and 
And most of all, don't promise to keep a secret. And this has happened to me um, many, many times with my youth. Please don't tell, please, please, please don't tell. My mom's gonna kill me, please, 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 please. right? Um, now, a lot of times, when someone's suicidal and they're sharing this information with you, it's because ultimately they want help in easing their pain. They don't know how about to go, to go about doing it, um, even though they can verbally contradict it, okay? They usually want help, um, but you don't wanna keep their secrets. So my suggestion for those who are gonna be referring out to somebody else is to say something along the lines of like, look, I know sharing something like this with me, um, must have been extremely difficult and i feel really honored that you trusted to share this with me but the truth is is that i don't have the training to help you i want to make sure that you're okay so i'm going to go with you so we can do one of two things i can go with you to talk with somebody else and sit with you i can sit outside the door with you or whatever it might be but don't promise to make that secret. If anything, it is so much more helpful to be transparent in a loving and caring way with kids than to lie and tell them you're not going to tell anybody and, and, and tell them anyway. So just be transparent with them, okay? Uh, my, my, I've actually had very good luck except for one case, one case in about 20 years with being transparent. I need to tell somebody, um, I care about you. I need to call the crisis team. Ultimately, we just want to make sure you're okay. Okay. Um, some of the screeners um, that are available um, include uh, the Columbia Suicide Severity Rating Scale. Um, and I'm just bringing this up. I know that a lot of our schools don't always use um, actual screeners and we use more of a protocol. I used a protocol just to let you know, but this, this um, screening scale is free, so that's a winner, right? Um, and it's very brief. It's about four to six questions that just can help guide your response. So you can do your entire protocol and just make sure that it includes these four to six questions that assess for ideation severity within this last month as well as the last three months. Um, what we're supposed to do with those questions, of course, as we always should do, is combine the results with clinical judgment to determine the risk levels and to make the clinical decisions about care. So you always want to use your clinical judgment, okay? Sometimes things don't seem right. Sometimes the kids say, no, I'm fine, but you see all these other behaviors that are prompting you to, for you to be concerned. I would say, err on the side of caution at all times. Um, the nice thing about this scale is that it can um, work with children who are, um, it has uh, at all age levels beginning at the age of six or developmentally disabled. <coughs> Excuse me. So it's got your standard scale and it's got also a scale for very young children or for those who are cognitively impaired. Um, in terms of administration requirements, any professional can uh, administer this so you don't have to have a mental health background. That's the other thing that I like about this. And it is evidence supported, okay? Um, so if you're looking for a screening scale, I would suggest that you consider this. I've got resources at the back of the training that will tell you where to locate this, okay? This is an example of the, scale, the severity scale for, um, this is for the, our, our general population. So our older, older youth, okay? Older youth and adults, okay? Uh, questions con con uh, are related to, have you wished you were dead or wished you um, could go to sleep and not wake up? Have you actually had any thoughts of killing yourself? Um, and if, if the answer to that question is, is yes, um, we wanna move on to the next one. Have you thought about how you would do this? Have you had these thoughts or some intention on acting upon them? Have you started to um, work out or worked out the details of how you would kill yourself? You, so you can see here, this screen is looking at ideation, plan of action, um, means, access to means, as well as eminency, right? So it's hitting all those variables that we talked about before. And the nice thing is with the color coding, you can kind of um, eyeball whether they're low risk, moderate, moderate risk, or high risk. So this is really helpful for people that are just starting off in the field, 
right? For people that are still very uncomfortable about how to proceed with the screening, but I like it because it, it, it kind of standardized the procedure, the questions that we should ask, okay? Um, now, safety um, is not a um, standardized screener, but it's more of a protocol, okay? So it's an interview format that we use to gather information to, related to safety risk, okay? The nice thing about safety is um, uh, we look at ideation within the last 48 hours, past month or worst ever, we're looking, we're assessing the plan of action, um, including access to the means and uh, preparatory acts, are they rehearsing? Um, we're looking at behaviors, so we're considering past and aborted attempts, rehearsals versus uh, non-suicidal self-injurious behaviors, and intent, is there imminency? Do they intend to follow through? So once again, it's hitting all those variables that we talked about that are important to hit when we're looking at a suicide screening. Um, another, another good thing about this is there's a mobile app available. Um, so for those of you, so for example, as a school psych, um, I think the most schools I've been assigned at at one time are maybe six or seven schools. So you can imagine um, how difficult it is to move from one school to the next. So having uh, an app available makes things a lot easier in terms of you know, assessing these types of things. Okay, so that's another um, protocol that you can research if you're looking for um, something a little bit more, uh, more of a protocol to help your school and or district. Okay, so let's say you have a positive screening. Uh-oh, what now, right? What now? We talked about this before. Keep them safe and don't leave them alone even for a minute. And like I said, I've literally had people um, just walk outside the door, kind of holding on to that door where the student's right behind them, not making eye contact with their student while they're talking, consulting with the clinical psych or whomever it might be, and the student has engaged in some, some very concerning problematic stuff. Okay, so we want to keep them safe. Um, we want to make sure we restrict access to lethal means. Uh, so, so suicides typically occur with little planning when experiencing a short-term crisis. So if they have a backpack, we want to make sure that there's, there's nothing, you know, um, concerning in that backpack, for example. Do you, you know, you thought about using pills. Do you have any pills with you right now? Are there pills at home? Okay. Uh, you want to assess your need to contact the crisis team available at your school district and call 911 if necessary. Um, like I said, I've only had to call 911 one time, and that was because a student um, ran, ran away from me when she found out I had to call the crisis team. And um, so we had to call 911 for safety. Um, and it was scary, um, but it, it was necessary, okay? The other thing we want to do is we want to make sure, you know, let's be honest, administrators, they want to know what's going on at their school. Okay, they want to know what's going on with their school um, for safety's sake. They want to make sure the students safe. They want to make sure they know who's going to be coming on campus. Is the crisis mobile outreach team coming on campus? Hey, I called 911. They're on their way. FYI, that sort of thing. Let sh make sure your administrator know what's, knows what's going on. Guardians need to know too, right? We have a um, we have a due diligence to let guardians know if their child is planning on hurting themselves. Not only that, but we want to include them. We're going to talk about this later. We want to include them in safety planning so that we can all be on the same page, okay? Um, we want to make sure that our students and their families are provided resources. So we want to provide them emergency resources such as access to uh, the National Suicide Prevent Prevention Line and local crisis resources. We also want to provide them with resources for local behavioral health resources and peer support contacts. Okay, we want to make sure they're walking away from our office with resources. Okay, you can't just let them leave and, and not have any anything for them to access in the event that um, they experience a crisis once again, they experience ideation once again. Um, and we want to determine our follow up monitoring plan and behavioral health supports. So if our kiddo is high risk, we want to make sure Definitely don't leave them alone, remove dangerous objects, notify admin and guardians, ask guardians to come to the school, contact the crisis team you want them to come in and do the assessment, 
to determine the eminency or call 911 if necessary, release only to the parent or crisis responders. So the bell rings at two o'clock. You're not letting them leave your office. Okay, they have to be monitored and with somebody at all times. Obtain written consent to consult with outside providers. Alert appropriate school officials, meaning uh, do you need to report this to your school psychologist, your school clinical, um, clinical psychologist, uh, your department head? Um, we would advise conducting a reentry meeting when they return if they've been away from school to create a safety plan then. It's not advisable to create a safety plan at that moment because kids are going to be out of sorts. They're not going to be able to think, think clearly to develop a, a safety plan. So usually this, um, they're going to create a, a home safety plan with a crisis team uh, or emergency response. We want to make sure we're um, creating a school safety plan upon their return, relying on current rec recs, concerns, and supervisory monitoring needs. So, you know, are they allowed to go to the bathroom? If they go to the bathroom, of course, they're allowed to go to the bathroom, but um, do we need to check on them in five minutes? Are we, you know, sending them um, sending them with supports. Do they need to have eyes on supervision at all times? That sort of thing. And once again, document everything, right? The assessment results, who you contacted, the plan of action. In terms of moderate risk, once again, not notifying admin and guardians and providing those resources. Refer to a community provider. Okay, at the schools, um, you know, as a school psychologist, I can screen. My job isn't to provide intense treatment. Right, I, I don't have that back, that type of background, so I want to make sure I'm referring to a community provider so that they can learn these coping skills and things of that nature, and make sure we can get written consent to consult if the parents agree to that. Sometimes I have parents who are like, "No way," and I I can comfort them by saying, "Look, I don't need to know uh, details related to this, that, or the other, but if if we could have uh, consent specific to." safety planning that would be helpful and usually i have parents who are okay with that if i if i'm able to specify that in the written consent contact um, crisis team if necessary release only to parent or crisis responder create that safety plan if they left school make sure we have re-entry procedures put into place and document for low risk once again we're contacting parents and guardians we're creating that safety plan if appropriate providing access to resources and documenting. I'm moving quickly because I know we're running out of time. Safety planning, what is safety plan? We're developing this um, plan collaboratively with students and families. And it serves as a, re as a reference point if suicidal thoughts happen again. We're not using this as a moral discussion. We're not using this as a permanent removal of means. Um, but we wanna make sure we're developing this after the crisis. Okay, some of the things we want to talk about are what are their warning signs and cues and triggers of potential crisis? We want to identify what those are. What are the triggering stressors? We want to identify the, the child's coping strategies. What can they use on their own and with others? We want to distract from the crisis. What can we do? What can be done to distract them? We want to identify their supports, considering family, peers, supportive adults. Who can they talk to in order to help with resolving a crisis? We want to identify. Uh, resources, emergency and crisis numbers, as well as local local resources. And we want to talk about with parents, particularly, as well as students, how do we reduce access to lethal means? Sometimes they're going to have to lock things up for a while and be very mindful of what's in their environment. And we want to make sure we're reviewing this plan periodically so that it can grow and change with the child. In terms of school safety planning, we talked about a reentry meeting. Um, I highly recommend this. I've done this with my schools. Um, it's very helpful. Um, we do want to make sure at the school it is helpful to have one staff member be the primary point of contact to make sure communication is streamlined. We want to make sure we're doing daily check-ins for the first couple of weeks. Daily check-ins could be on a scale of 1 to 10. How are you feeling? Are you having any suicidal thoughts today? Okay. Um, we do want to temporarily increase counseling supports or phone check-ins if they're not in school. We want to do that, um, increase that for the first couple of weeks as well. We want to ensure, ensure relevant staff understand the child's warning signs, triggers, side effects of medications, and referral steps if they need it. We want to arrange for makeup work so they're not penalized for missing school or, or inability to concentrate and produce work at the same level if they're going through this. 
and arrange for safety provisions. Can they leave class without an escort for safety? Things like that, okay? In terms of parent notification, you do want to notify parents as soon as the student is identified at risk for suicide and request to come to school immediately for high risk um, and review potential lethal means at home and the need to temporarily move, remove them. For those that are low to moderate risk that don't require hospitalization, we want to provide with resources. Um, if you believe a student is in danger of self-harm and parent refuses to seek services, it may um, result in, in a mandated report to Child Protective Services for negligence. Um, if there's an imminent risk of suicide is related to parental abuse, you do want to notify Protective Services it's about the safe, safety of the child, okay? So you want to contact them first. Um, you, if your child, you do want to follow up parents in a few days. Hey, how's it going? Did you see an outside provider? Um, if they have not, find out why. Is there anything you can do to help? Document every contact with parents, okay? Every contact you have. And, um, and some schools do have parents sign an acknowledgement form stating that they've been informed of their child's risk and have received re referrals. So it really is up to your school and your district as to whether they wanna proceed with that or not. In terms of confidentiality, do not share clinical information on details related to the suicidal behavior. Only share information with staff necessary to preserve student safety, such as that related to their treatment and support needs. Um, we're not having general classroom discussions because that's violating confidentiality. Um, in terms of FERPA, we can disclose student information without consent to appropriate parties if that information is necessary to protect the health and safety of the student. So if you have a student who is suicidal or expressing suicidal thoughts, there are some officials that have interpreted this to mean that this is significant threat to health or safety. Um, so that's how FERPA has interpreted that. Um, some schools have been found negligent for failure to notify parents if children have appeared suicidal. If they fail to get assistance for student, a student at risk of suicide um, and failure to adequately supervise a student at risk of suicide. Now, um, part of my typo, I just noticed some of those now. Um, you never want to negate a child's um, uh, suicidal thought. So if they say, I've had thoughts, you want to say, oh, they're just looking for attention. You always, always, always take it seriously, 100% of the time, okay? Always err on the side, on the side of caution. Um, if you truly have evidence to show this is attention seeking, you want to get together with your team of professionals and, and defer, uh, maybe develop a behavioral support plan, okay? But you never, ever, ever, um, you know, take this as a joke. It's always serious, okay? Um, and that's it for now. I'm going to let you guys, it's already noon. I'll let you guys go through the resources on your own, but we've got some crisis lines, um, reviews of some advanced training and risk assessment. Um, if you want to get advanced training, I've, I've done one or more of these myself. Um, in service training for your teachers, um, one thing they recommend is for teachers to be aware of warning signs and risk factors so that they can be better able to refer. And they're doing this for, for peers as well in middle schools and high schools so that they can refer um, their, their peers at risk, um, access um, of examples of safety plans, as well as other general resources, as well as references. Okay, so thank you for coming today. I appreciate your time. I'm going to go ahead and hand this back to David. Thanks so much, Erin.